I think it's about that time. Woo. I think. Yay. Thank you guys for coming. I appreciate uh, you showing up at this. I guess it's not all that late, is it? Um, I really quickly want to introduce our speakers who need no introduction, but I also want to tell you what this is. I'm Rob Connery. This is Head to Head, and the idea of doing this is we have two lovely and talented speakers up here who are going to answer various questions thought up by me. And the idea was, is I give them a question, they go and research the way they would do it, and then they don't speak to each other at all, and then get together and show their solutions. That's the idea, at least. But what's really going to happen is John's going to start talking, everything's going to go crazy, <laughs> and then we'll go from there. Um, so anyway, uh, this is Kathleen Dollard, by the way. Yay. Everybody. Hey, Kathleen Dollard. And I'm sorry, I forgot your name. Jeff. Jeff. Thanks. Jeff Jones, uh, John Skeet, of course. This is John Skeet, needs no introduction. Uh, and I guess that's about it. We'll just get going here. Um, oh, also, before, really quickly before we start, um, if you have any questions, we want this to be interactive, shout it out. And then I'll make sure to come and get the uh, question from you and ask our lovely and talented speakers. It will be really boring if you do not. Yes, okay. please. So I'm going to try and goose you guys. I'm not going to make you stand up. He will. But uh, off we go. Okay, John, okay. kick it off. Cool. Uh, yeah, so... I had heard some scurrilous rumors that there were some software engineers that were not straight white men. But, you know, looking out, I'm glad to see it's clearly not true. I, I see a, one, one, and Kathleen, obviously. Um, <laughs> there are a few out there. Um, this is our problem to fix. I repeat this at virtually every conference I go to. Please make this conference more diverse next year. Invite your colleagues who aren't straight white men. Say how awesome NDC is. Uh, be respectful of all people. Make it a very inclusive conference. Rant over. I'm done. Um, sorry, I just, it, it bugs me like crazy. Um, hopefully we can make things better. Okay, so the first question uh, that Rob came up with, um, I have a slight advantage on, very, very slight, in that it's on a blog post that I wrote like six months ago, um, which was around NUnit. And uh, yeah, I would try to demonstrate this now, but uh, A, I've got a Windows machine, rather than a Linux box, and B, I think the, uh, the problem has now been fixed. Um, certainly, I think I submitted a patch for it. Um, so it was really an exercise in diagnostics. I had uh, come up with no time, so my date time library come tomorrow at 9 o'clock to learn more about dates and times. Um, and obviously, this is something that's ideal for running on .NET Core. And so, Earlier this year, I was saying, right, can I run the unit tests on .NET Core? There are about 15,000 unit tests in no time, uh, which is much, more Im uh, much less impressive than it sounds because we've got quite a few tests that just run against all possible cultures on the machine. So you know, that gets 1,000 tests per time you actually write a test. Um, and I was horrified to see that uh, the Linux build was about 10 times as slow, or 6 to 10 times as slow as the Windows build. So I normally run uh, the non-slow tests. I've got about three slow tests, but the rest run in, I think, about 20 seconds or so, except on Linux it was taking forever, really a very long time. Um, and I thought, well, clearly .NET Core is awful and I shall abandon it forever. Um, and I thought maybe that might not be the problem. So what's really interesting to me about this whole process is uh, not, oh, I found a bug or a problem in NUnit, uh, so much as the diagnostic aspect of it. Um, and so jump in, Kathleen, any time uh, you want to, to mention something. So just the, the steps involved, um, it's all on my code blog, but this is something that can be applied uh, any time you are going to ask a question on Stack Overflow or any time you run into problems. This is my way of thinking about diagnostics, um, and it works pretty well for me. Um, so hopefully you can do something similar. So I started Has off Has anybody looked at this post? Anybody? I mean, I looked at it. A couple of okay. people looked at this post, just trying to get an idea of where they were like telling you something. You're like yeah, totally just, already knowing. Just you know? about sufficiently few that it's still worth proceeding. Yeah, yeah. I think <laughs> it, no, I think we should definitely proceed. Yeah. Um, so you know, our step one is we think we've got a problem. Um, and you need to make sure that you actually do have a problem. So if you notice something going oddly, what's the first thing you do? Do it again, yes. Uh, try turning it off and on again, and then do it again. 
Um, and sure enough, I ran, I think I ran it four or five times, and that was plenty to let me know this wasn't my machine being crazy. Um, and I'll give you one hint when it comes to performance stuff. It's really helpful if you've got the same hardware. I have two Intel Nooks, i5 little Nooks. They are the, m the sweetest little computers you've ever seen. You know, they ship in a box that's about the same diameter as a CD, and that's got some packing inside. They're tiny little things. Um, and I bought my first one uh, a few years ago, and then I specifically got on eBay the exact same model. So it had the exact same processor, not just another i5, but the exact same processor model, um, and obviously about half the price. And so I've got Windows on one and Linux on the other. Obviously, you could dual boot, but I've got these permanently connected. Um, so I, I knew that I was running on reasonable performance rigs, and both of the machines were idle apart from running these tests. Um, so we, we know we've got a problem. The next thing is, without disturbing anything else, how can we try to isolate the problem? So before you start changing code, how can you reduce the amount of work that's going on? And in this case, these are unit tests. It's really easy. Try to find a unit test that demonstrates this problem well. And fortunately, NUnit can spit out some XML that lets you say, right, well, how long did each test take? Um, and so I just tried to find an example of a test. There were some tests that took radically different amounts of time, but I kind of knew what the, why they were taking different amounts of time. I knew they would be exercising some different paths, either in node time or doing lots of work with the BCL. And I specifically wanted to find something that wouldn't be doing much stuff in system dot XYZ that I was aware of and that was part of my test code, if you see what I mean. So I eventually found, let's uh, see the exact test name because it's fun, uh, the Omalkara year month cal day calculator test dot get year month day, day since epoch, um, which just checks for some self consistency. So I start at the start of time and uh, I add a day to the date until I reach the end of time, and I compare that with you know, 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. So in some ways, it's kind of a boring test. Uh, however, it showed this exact 10 to 1 uh, thing. So I could now run just that one test from the command line, you know, remove all the writing some XML so that it would really be just running that one test. Um, one thing I would recommend about NUnit is it's got a really powerful way of saying, I would uh, like to only run some tests. You, you put minus minus where equals, and then you can put a class that has a name a bit like this, matching, matching a regular expression. How many of you use XUnit? OK. Uh, how easy is it not from Visual Studio to run a single test? What would you do? Sorry? Write it in NUnit. Right yeah. I'm a big fan of NUnit. Uh, for work, I use XUnit. Um, but in XUnit, you can put minus method, and then you put the fully qualified name of the method, which by the time you've got the, the whole namespace and the class name and the method name is a pain. Uh, in NUnit, you can do that, or you can just put method equals tilde for uh, make it a regex match. And then, uh, I, as it happens, I do have a couple of things that I'll get year, month, day, day since epoch. But you know, I could easily whittle it down. So um, I thoroughly recommend the NUnit filter style way. If you're ever writing any tools, Think about that kind of use case, please. Um, so I'm still in NUnit at this point, and I've still got Node Time involved. So I've got three different bits of code. And I don't like that from a diagnostic point of view. Um, so the first thing I tried to remove was Node Time. Uh, sorry, was, was NUnit, actually. So I removed the assertions. You know, at that point, OK, NUnit is starting my method, but then the whole method runs and then reports a result in the end. No assertions going on. And suddenly, Linux, Windows, basically the same amount of time. OK, this is very strange. So I've got an assertion in there. And the assertion is between two local dates, I think. Um, but you know, it's a pretty simple one. And I, realizing that the assertion was something to do with it, I started getting rid of node time. So I ended up with a bit of code. Let me blow that up a bit. Uh, so here is a simple NUnit test, no node time at all, and that takes 10 times as long to run on Linux as Windows. And it's only comparing integers. 
So at that point, something is very weird. <coughs> There's not a lot of BCL code going on here. You know, we're not doing anything with strange calendars that may be um, inefficiently implemented. So it's really assert.r equal. At that point, hey, this is open source. So you delve, start delving into the code. I don't think, do you have any ideas about how I would work out the bottleneck here without either using profiling, because profiling is going to be relatively hard doing it on .NET Core on Linux. There may be profilers out there, but I haven't used them, so it would right, take me right, hours. Okay. Um, anything else you'd have done at that point? Honestly, what I would have done, it's embarrassing, I would have done console.write lines in there, knowing I was taking a small hit, but assuming that was consistent across them. It's ugly, but it probably is what so I would have so done. write what, though? The <laughs> timing before and after? I don't know. Yeah. Um, and I'm, uh, who's switching us? Am we switching us or somebody back there switching us? Can you switch to mine as for just a magic. second? I just want to let you guys know, because I'll make sure this is available later. What I'm doing is I'm writing down the steps that John's going through, because on this one, honestly, this is just like the fact that NUnit had a bug and got, it got fixed. Who's going to get excited about that? Anybody? John told him to fix a bug in NUnit. That's awesome. What's awesome about this is the fact that he's going through a very specific process, and I want to record that process for you because I think it's the interesting part of what we're doing absolutely. right now. Oh, so I want to show that I'm doing that. We know it's on NUnit. Because I was typing. I, that was why. Because when you asked me that question, I was like, Sorry. wait, I was just typing. <laughs> <laughs> so I wasn't quite ready for that. So um, I'm going to let you get back to work then. We're going to sure. get back to his machine, but we'll switch back and forth a couple yep. of times. Adam, so, switch, whoop, please. Adam, switch. Okay, the voice recognition, only, I think the microphone for voice recognition is near Rob. Um, if we call him something other than Adam, will he still do it? <laughs> uh, so um, there are various things I looked at, and units equality, and like many, many test frameworks, there are loads of different ways of doing equality. So I won't bore you with the details, but checked a bunch of different things um, and ended up with looking at, this was the only place I could find a difference between a way of checking equality that was fast and a way of checking equality that was slow. Because to be clear, there's no way I'm going to change every call to assert dot r equal in node time to do something that I know will be faster, but is much less convenient. Um, and I know people use assert dot that and stuff, but I'm not a fan of that particular way of doing things for simple equality uh, checks. So we've got. Um, this constraint and something, there is a problem somewhere in here, we know. Well, there's a, a, bun a bunch of different um, calls going on, but mostly you know, I can see three calls to ends with and a couple of substrings and using get type. Um, but to be honest, by this point, I had thought that it might be something to do with reflection. So I thought maybe it's get type.name and I just randomly thought, well, I'll just try this. Um, this was a lucky guess. But this is, at this point, you don't even need to have n unit running at this point. I can have, and in fact, ha, step six, remove n unit. Um, you can see the problem without n unit at all. I haven't even shown the code because it's so obvious. You, you just write something that uses stopwatch. Uh, always use stopwatch rather than datetime.utc now or anything if you're measuring elapsed time. Um, a, it's more accurate. B, it doesn't get affected by if NTP decides to switch the system clock. You know, system diagnostic stopwatch is your friend for measuring elapsed time. Um, and you can basically run a lot of iterations. This isn't modifying anything. This isn't creating any new objects. This is about as pure a performance test as you can get. Um, and lo and behold, it's massively slow on and it's compared with Windows. And so I asked the .NET Core team, and they said, oh, yeah, OK, it turns out there's um, an optimization on Windows that isn't present on Linux uh, to do with the current culture. Um, so you can, you can look at the details on GitHub, but it's one of those things where it's more detailed than you really want to know other than, well, at least someone understands it. And they can try to improve things in the future as well. So I filed the Core CLR bug. Um, but also, it's entirely work-roundable. Um, there's an easy, uh, easy way of fixing it within an unit itself. 
So we don't really want to do a culture-aware um, comparison, and it's just possible that there are some weird cultures in terms of string comparisons where uh, it was actually a bug in NUnit in terms of behavior. I can't imagine that ends with would be affected um, unless you had some very interesting attributes. Um, but yeah, as soon as you move to string comparison.ordinal, it's actually, I think it's a little bit faster than either the Windows or the Linux version on both uh, of the current culture version on both um, Windows and Linux. So yeah, most of this, by, by the time we've got to uh, this code, we're really at the end of the diagnostic process and we're ready to start acting on stuff. But I guess my plea is if you're going to ask about some strange behavior on Stack Overflow, go through these steps so you've got something as short as this, ideally a non-end unit version. Um, and that's when you can say, hey, I've boiled this down as far as possible. I've removed node of time. I've removed end unit you know, in uh, a console app. And now I'm ready to ask the world why this is behaving weirdly. I'm just keeping with the mm. questions. Anyone have any questions for John about what he's doing and how he's doing it and why he's doing it and anything? Yes. Right. So I then change to, let's just see what happens if we do it with integers. Right. Oh, look, it's still really slow. OK, let's try all the different ways of doing equality within an unit. So the question, uh, sorry, I just want to repeat sorry. the question. Yeah. No, that's OK. The question was, uh, did you override equals? Is that what you mean? Or implement equals in a weird way? Is that what you're saying? Yeah, so the question was, how do I know it's not my code? Yeah? Yeah. And in no time, that's an entirely valid concern because the equals, the equality that I was checking was with my own stuff. So yeah, get rid of that as quickly as possible. Basically, try to shift blame as early as you can. <laughs> yeah, that's a good. That's it should I, be somebody yeah. else's fault. Although, shifting blame comes back to something that whenever you're attacking a problem on your computer, um, you will actually get further faster. I'll keep this very, very short. If you think of the negative and you try to disprove yourself, I keep that pretty short of some of the reasons the way your brain works. But it, what John was doing, he was saying, well, I want to take note of time out because he may have been even thinking maybe it was note of time because he has stuff in there that could be causing a problem. And he said, well, I'll take it out and then I'll know for sure. So this idea of uh, dissecting things, pulling things apart, divide and conquer. Mm -hmm. But with the notion of excluding big parts of your application, that's the fastest way to get to the bottom of any bug, any problem that you've got, including uh, this one. Um, can we go back to my machine for a second? Adam Switch. Yes. Adam Switch. Yeah, he's listening this to you, not me. This is the only point of having Rob here. It's great. He can say Adam Switch. <laughs> yeah, if I say that's it loud enough and <laughs> slow enough and I don't say Alexa first, Alexa, transfer $100,000 to my account. No, just kidding. Um, okay, so this is kind of what he did all the way through there. And a th couple things I wanted to, uh, to point out. I did not get this right. Uh, John, correct me. I just I couldn't remember the culture of the four-digit culture. But um, he was in Great Britain. This problem doesn't happen in U.S., right? I believe Isn't that that's one right. of the things yep. that you ran across yep. is that it, this that's why the team had never encountered it. So uh, you know, just remember that you're not in the culture that was the first one that got tested. Um, and then uh, the other thing is that you know sharing the knowledge is really important. And can we go back, Adam? Switch. Oh, oh look at done. that! Yes, so much power. Um, this is something that the team could work with. Actually, if John had just stopped here and done nothing else than and just sent it to the team, which all of you can do. If you don't have to send stuff to the team, send it to John or me. Um, I mean, it's really easy to do. We'll just mm -hmm. walk you through it. It's just this little button up there that says send something. So, um, yeah. I want to go, go back slightly on my try to shift blame as much as possible. Uh, I was very tongue in cheek there. And actually, the right uh, attitude is, it almost certainly is my fault. Um, I have seen so many questions saying, I'm 100% sure this code is correct, but it doesn't give the right answer. Right. I'm pretty convinced that the problem is going to be in your code rather than the compiler. And sometimes there will be compiler errors, sometimes there will be bugs in the standard libraries, etc. But assume that it is your fault first. And if you can try to disprove it 
being your fault, that's great. Uh, but and, and that's what I would suggest is that I'm assuming actually that John was thinking that because he actually is going to have less confidence in his code because how many people have run his code versus, and not a time a lot of people have run, but still this new code. Much fewer than ends with. Much, much fewer than ends with. Maybe not ends with in Great Britain on uh, Linux. Yep. But, you know, it's, it's it, the, 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 the Occam's razor, the simple thing is it's in his code. But if you try to prove that, you're going to waste a lot of time. It's going to be way faster to try to disprove it and say, I think it's in my code, so let me just see if I can prove that wrong. And then he did prove it. <laughs> he did prove it wasn't in his code, and then he got to go uh, talk to the team. And then uh, the other good thing, as well as if you can exclude, like I tried to exclude notice time, not only do you have a better idea of where the problem is or isn't, but you've actually made your, uh, your environment simpler to do the next step. So you know, it, divide and conquer is awesome in so many ways. Yeah. yeah, yeah, chop, 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 chop. Cool. OK. OK. Do you guys have anything else on this question? You guys ready for another question? Do you want us to keep talking about this one for an hour? <laughs> I, I want to hear uh, the next one. Kathleen says she has something very naughty. To do You're going to have to help me with the I'm really looking forward to this. My C Sharp 7, I promise something will be okay by tomorrow morning at 9 o'clock. But my version of Visual Studio 2017 went south 20 minutes ago. So you're going to help me on that one. But let's get to the question first. Am I up or are you up? Uh, oh, you're, you're up. That's cool. Okay, yep. so uh, we'll come to me in just a second. But let's talk about the, the question here pretty quick. Um, and that is pretty simple. How do you enumerate through an enum? Uh, if you scroll down a little bit, isn't there yep. an example of what he wants to do right below the yeah. uh, fold? And it, it's as simple okay. as you think. The, the question you wants wanted to, get to do all this? values. You have. OK, you have. Did you yep. do it? Because there's a pretty easy answer to this, actually. Um, and so uh, if we're not on me, we should be. Can we switch? Uh, Adam, switch. Out of interest, how many of you know the <laughs> obvious answer from if someone had asked you five years ago, or if someone had asked the you now that has all the knowledge now how you would have done this five years ago, how many of you know what you would say? It probably is what I'm going to do. Oh, that, that surprises me, actually, that it... It feels like it's a part of the BCL that's been there since 1.0. Yeah. What I'm going to uh, do has been there since the beginning of time. I'm yeah. not going to do anything fancy. OK, so I'm just going to do uh, speeds, uh, clubs. I don't know what order he had them in. I don't think it matters. Diamonds. And I need some hearts in there. OK, so now I've got this, the, the enum sitting there. And I'm just running a unit test because it's an easy way for, for me to do it. Um, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a variable. And for right now, I'm going to call it just Fred. Uh, just to get us started there. And now I'm going to use the enum type, uh, enum, and I'm going to say get values. Okay, so that's going to give me the values that are in the enum, and then I'm going to pass in a type, and that's going to be the type of the suit. This has been there like since the beginning of time. Now, that doesn't give me the right type because that returns an array. It's been there since the beginning of time. It's an array. It's just an array. That's not what I want. But an array is an I enumerable, so I can say dot cast. And then I can tell it what I want to cast to, which is suit. And then I can say, OK, that should work if I spell get. You guys, come on. This is massive pair programming. You can help me. It's OK. It really is OK. <laughs> Please. OK, so uh, as soon as I can manage to get rid of that extra E, this should be fine. What is the problem there? Um, that is probably because I need to do using system.link. That slows you down for just a second. And now we've got that. So now let's do uh, for each uh, var. Now I'm going to change this to being um, uh, suit members because Fred was a really bad name. Uh, so I'm going to say just uh, suit uh, member in suit members. Okay, there we go. And now what do you want me to do? Now this is where this question actually gets interesting in the first place, is that all they told us, all they said, was I want to enumerate through it. They didn't say why. And depending on the reason they wanted to do that, this may not be the right answer. So if they just wanted a list of the names, they could have used get names. So there's some other things that they might have done. But I'm going to assume that this actually is what they want, and that what they actually were just dying to do is console.write line with their suit, and I'm just going to say suit member because I want you to uh, know it passes. And then just because I think you'd like to see it, uh, let's say suit member uh, dot type of, get type, sorry. Uh, too many languages in my head. 
dot me. Okay, so does that sound good? Anybody want me to do anything else real quick? We got it? Do you guys want me to see this run or do you just totally trust me? Totally trust me, right? Yeah. All right, okay. So um, I will build it. And uh, do you have tuples? Uh, I do. Okay. Uh, what happened? Yeah, I'll, I'll install value tuple while you're... Uh, yeah, that's what I want. Yeah, yeah, you yeah. can have that ready to go. That would be awesome. Yep. Um, okay, so uh, if you don't know this, another reason I wanted to do it that way with console.writeline is that in the test runner, this is how you get to your uh, console.writeline stuff. Spade suit, club suit, diamond suit, heart suit. You guys see why I did that? It looks really stupid. It's really stupid output, but you see why I did it, right? Because we just interleave those in a really stupid way. Okay, so got that. So um, there's a couple of other things you can do depending on what you're looking for. If you just want an array of names, you can just say get names. Uh, there's some other things that you can do. But um, what I want to do is talk John through, and John and I kind of oh, probably are going to hopefully. That's what? Fine. I'm supposed to work at use your yeah, machine? Yeah, yeah. It's just a Surface Book. Oh, I have nothing dear. strange. Oh, dear. It's not like when Bill Wagner had me, uh, or I insisted on typing on Bill Wagner's machine, which had Code Rush installed, and it was suddenly popping things up I'd never used. Code I can do two code better Rush. than Sorry. you on that. One is I, honest to gosh, was once in where the machine wouldn't hook up, and the answer was I was supposed to use the venue machine, which had a, wait for it, yes, a Hungarian keyboard, and that's awesome. true. True story. Uh, uh, Catalin Giorgio saved my neck because he knows a tiny bit of Hungarian. Um, the, so it's all in Hungarian the notation. The other one is, is <laughs> the other one is my son, who if he touches my machine, there's uh, Dvorak on it, and so if I hit the wrong keys, all of a sudden I'm in Dvorak world, and so that's quite sad for me. Okay, so anyway, we're in this world, and what I asked John about was whether he has a NuGet package in called Value Tuple. You could, we got tuples in 2012. Uh, we get tuples in, I think, 2012, and they were done badly. I'm sorry. They just were. And we have a new tuple. I won't go into why that difference is unless I touch on it tomorrow morning. But you don't even have suit in here. I've got to create that. Uh, I, I, it's, in another, you create it? it's in another class. Oh, we have that? It's okay, fine. so we've yeah. got all that. Okay. Adam switch. Oh. Adam switch. Adam switch. <laughs> all right. Okay. Good. Okay. Okay, so what I want to do is I'm going to create an extra class just because I just kind of feel like creating more classes. So this is going to be just like a public static um, uh, bad. Sorry, yeah, backslash may not be where you expect. <laughs> I knew this was going to go badly. Let's see. If one more key, one more typo and he's going to type. That's okay, fine. don't worry. Uh, bad extensions. Bad extensions. Be very careful. <laughs> be very careful. These are extensions. It's just going to be extension methods. Um, okay. Oh, I'll, I'll, you start yeah, typing. Yeah, yeah. This is not worth it. Okay. Create, create a, a public probably, static class. Um, you need a cl the word class in there. I was distracted by your keyboard. Public static class. We're going to create an extension method. That's why it says extensions. Okay. Public static uh, void. And then uh, call. it's very important name. Deconstruct. Okay, and then via this, and then a suit, we'll do it this way, suit, and then uh, we're going to hand it back. Um, uh, let's hand back an innumerable. And that's an out. He knew this because he's actually done this before, but it is an out. Uh, uh -huh. It has to be an out here. And this is a very, uh, it has to be exactly this, uh, this uh, syntax. Okay, and then give that, an, uh, you have an extra parentheses. Well, I, I, I'm what you guessing what do? you're doing. But oh, you're going to be even worse. <laughs> okay, let's do it. Okay, and then close that. And then Does this give work? I have no idea whether you can it, do it, it. It should work. Okay, okay. Cool. This is a double tuple. Yeah, we're going to have fun here. I was going to do a little differently. <laughs> okay, so that's cool. And then uh, go ahead and uh, we'll create a method here. And so the, the bulk of the method is just pretty much going to be what we just did. Uh, let's just say uh, um, enum dot get values, pass the type of suit, and then uh, let's do that to a cast, which will give us an yep. enumerable. And let's, but be, you know, instead of a cast there, let's just do a select. Why don't we do it in one place if we can? Uh, Unless you were going to do two constructors no, on top do, of each other. Do, that seems really Let's go via cool. the suit, uh, via the cast. So we've, we've okay. definitely got a suit in our hand. Now we have a suit. Okay, yeah. so now we can just return. Um, uh, actually, how are you going to do this? We're going to do uh, suit, dot, suit. There's not a suit dot value, not a little suit dot value. Um, well, we can do, just do the suit and suit dot the string. 
Okay, that's perfect. Perfect, perfect, perfect. So we're not exactly to returning. We're returning uh, a suit, not an integer. I was, messed, I was trying to return an integer. Okay, so everybody follows us so far, right? That should work fine. What do we do with a deconstructor? And that has to be set to uh, your out value, to which say is suits. suits equals. Yep. Okay. Great. Okay. Uh, it, no compiley. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. Um, let's make it a public. Ah, public enum. Fine. So the public didn't match up. We had an internal and a public. That was, should have been the whole problem. We think this should work. What's the other dun, problem? Dun, dun. Uh, uh, it's still you less. just need to build? Save. Oh, good. Yeah, there we go. Woo. Slow. Slow, okay. slow, slow, slow. That's good. Okay. okay, so that's a deconstructor. So what you care about is how you actually use that. Okay, so you can just say, uh, you should just be able to say var, um, and then uh, give it any, uh, any variable name you want. We're not exactly, it's not going to be as fun as it could be. So we might change this a little bit more in just a second. Uh, equals, uh, and then we actually need to hand it a suit. So do you want to just do zero, uh, put, put that in parentheses. Put suit in parentheses and yep. zero, yeah. So we're just passing it any suit. This is even a in, completely invalid suit, yep. okay? And I don't think you need that one, but you do need your semi and everything should be fine there. And then uh, Jeff should be the I enumerable. But that's not very interesting because it doesn't look like a tuple, and we wanted to make a tuple here. Well, it's at so the moment, surely that Jeff is going to be just a suit. Uh, not deconstructing anything with, with var. Jeff should be, what is Jeff right now? Jeff should be an I enumerable. Uh, only oh, if we oh you're it saying it's not. An I enumerable. So if we. You're right. It's not okay. Okay. Uh, there we go. Cannot implicitly convert okay. that to. I have another way I want to I go back. <laughs> go to deconstruct and before the first out, add another one, which is just string uh, and name. Okay. No, 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 just no, small. Just, no, what are you doing? I thought you were doing a whole, no, a whole no, other no, 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 right here, right here, right here. <laughs> okay, right here. Let's just add okay. um, an out for a string of a name. Okay, okay. Right. yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's right. just do that. Okay, so, so that just is a good way to force this into, yes, thank you very uh, much. Name. Give, just give it a name. Name, comma, yeah. Jeff. Yeah, that's all I want to do. Uh, yes, and now okay. get rid of the word Jeff. Jeff is now misplaced, Yes. Okay, yep. so now this should be good. Woo, yes, woo. it should be beautiful. I don't this know why deconstructed. Oh, we, do, we haven't put name. Uh, name equal oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, suit.string, fine. Uh, yeah, but we don't really, yeah, okay, sure. I have no idea what zero is going to give us. I was just going to do suit. In It'll quotes. get us spades in this particular case, but because that is the zero value of is my... Is it going to completely, is it going to give us something or is it going to die there? It's going to give spades. Oh, because, because spades is the yeah, zero. Yeah, okay, cool. uh, but if we, no if we had spades equals one, it will give zero as a string. Okay, good. Okay. At any rate, we can run this now. And this is what we want. All that's uh, side stuff. Okay, okay so, so yeah, do, just so the they name. believe it works. Okay, so this is actually the reason that we said bad <laughs> is uh, because we have completely like undermined the meaning of deconstruction. What the heck? Why would anybody walk up and think that the way you would deconstruct a enum called suit is into the name of the value you passed plus an I enumerable of the other values in the list? I'm just going to check that it actually works. Yeah, I think you should do that. Woo! All right. Uh, yeah, and okay. <laughs> so one of those is a string and the other is the value, but the value is being converted into a string anyway. You wanted to get the, the values as ints, didn't you? So if we make it int string... So we can see the numeric value for the name. That'll do it. So uh, now, wrong, wrong one. Uh, there we go. Okay. Okay. So, questions. So, the reason I want to show you this is to show you deconstruction. You can do anything you want with deconstruction, but for goodness sakes, don't. Have your deconstruction be something where if you walked up to that value and you deconstructed it, it makes sense. So a sensible deconstruction here um, was actually be that you pass back the integer and the name as a string and an integer. That would be a sensible deconstruction on the spades of a suit. What we did is a nonsensical deconstruction. So as you look at deconstruction, there are no limits whatsoever on what stupid things you do. So I would suggest that for the good of your friends, and keeping your friends and staying employed, that you do smart things with that feature. But that is uh, that little just, you know, we're creating tuples with the little parentheses there. You can see more of that, that in my talk tomorrow morning.
as I soon have as I figure out who's going to run, give Thanks. me a laptop. You have another one? Uh, yeah. So, All right. Uh, ah, okay. Yeah, there is a problem with the 2017 release candidates today. Thank you. Yes, today. And I'm unfortunately, everyone tomorrow. from Microsoft is here at NDC, so we can't get it fixed. Yeah, I may have a personal problem in addition to that. I'll be working on that after this. But if anybody has a, a version of 2017 uh, RC uh, or later that is working happily and you are willing to be my code monkey tomorrow, let me know. I would love to be your code monkey I tomorrow, but talking. I'm presenting other things. Yeah, if anyone would like to present schedule. my talk tomorrow morning, <laughs> which I haven't written yet, uh, if you want to write it as well, that'd be great. Um, then, then I can be Kathleen's code, code monkey. Um, I want to show you a different way of doing this because uh, I don't like enum.get values. Um, because two reasons. Firstly, it gives you back an enum array. Um, and actually, that causes the second reason. So it's an enum array, which means we don't know that it's the right type. And so we have to call cast. And also, uh, every time we call it, it's got to create a new array, because arrays are always mutable. So this feels like a great way that we could have a, uh, an extension method, um, sorry, a, a method that takes a generic type argument um, and caches a read-only collection of enum values. OK, Th this sound good so far? So now, let I, me I just have to warn you, stepping off a slight cliff here with something that he said. And we're going to make sure that he gets this part right, which is that he's going to have an extension method. It's going to be generic on enums. And since yeah. we don't have a constraint against enums, you can't say where t is an enum. Do you know, which I genuinely we should be don't able to know do. whether Kathleen's uh, looked at what's coming up or, no, or I, not. I, I, I may have looked at your blog. Okay, good. Okay. <laughs> oh, that was going to be so fun watching your face when. Ah. Um, yeah, yeah, yeah. Right, yeah, yeah. so it, uh, this one actually isn't an, an extension method, but I've got various other things that are. So I've got enums.getValues suit, and that will return some kind of read only collection. I can't remember what I've. Uh, it just returns an i list of t, uh, but. I have documented that it's read-only. And it, indeed, if you try to modify it, it will go bang. Um, this is using a reference to my unconstrained melody um, library, which I wrote. It's, it's one of these toy libraries that was mostly to prove I could. Um, but it, I believe it's actually useful, and some people may have it in production. I have no reason to doubt that it works. Um, there are even tests and everything. Um, however, as Kathleen says, this looks like it's probably a dangerous call, because what's to stop us writing enum.getValues string? Well, OK, we could constrain t to be a value type. As we know, all enums are value types. Um, let's, let's try to write this class. So if we had class um, new enums, um, and we have public static uh, i list of t get values of t. So We'll just return null for now, because we're only interested in uh, the, the declaration, really. So we could do where t is a struct. Not good enough. And that's not good enough, because then we could do get values of grid. And that's not nice. Uh, where t is class doesn't help us. So what we want to write is where t derives from enum and is a struct, uh, other way around. Not that it matters, because it's still invalid. So that kind of looks, it, it's what we want it to do. And there's no problem with having two constraints, one of which is the value type constraint, and one of which is you know, maybe i enumerable uh, of t, for example. OK, so this now will only return uh, values for a type t, which is a value type, which also implements i enumerable of itself. Great. But I can't do enum. Uh, because those stupid darn language designers said that I couldn't. And do you know what the, the most annoying thing about this is? If you look at the CLI spec, so not the C sharp language, but the runtime, it not only doesn't have this silly constraint that you can't derive from enum, it gives it as an example of a useful thing to do. Um, and the, you know, the, the other one you would want to have is delegate. And both numeric. enums are numeric. and delegates. Numeric's harder. Yeah, numeric, numeric is, is harder. And yes. there's two numerics you want. But these two are easy. Um, so my uh, unconstrained melody seems to have, so I can't, can't write that properly, but I seem to have something that has 
all the right things. If I try calling enum.getValues, oh look, you can't read this, but trust me, the type int cannot be used as type parameter t in the generic type or method enums.getValues. There is no boxing conversion from int to system.enum. Wow. The compiler understands the constraint, even though I can't express it in C sharp. Um, now, unconstrained melody, I don't actually have the project on this machine, uh, but it's all on GitHub. And fortunately, unconstrained melody as one word is you know, very easy to search for. There aren't many other hits. Um, and, and I'm going to suggest we let people look for that. Yeah. So we don't spend too much time on that. Absolutely. Because we have some other stuff that we, we ought to look at. But the, the, the one liner is it runs ILDASM, uh, does yeah. some monkeying around just in the plain That's text seriously. of the IL. N not for me, any mono.cecil or whatever, but just run ILDASM, handcraft the IL, then run ILDASM again, and you end up with the right constraints. I it will definitely work, but I would also suggest that you know how to go to uservoice.com and say, yeah, really please, we want this. Yeah, really please, we want this. And, uh, and get those voted up and because they're doable. Yeah. They're doable. We don't oh. have, numerics might be harder. They really whine a lot when we talk about numerics. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Can I just, can you just comment on one more thing about the spec and the fact that the languages are, have such a hard time you guys probably know that if you say protected internal, then the, that item is visible in any protected class and any other class within that DLL. So you're with me so far, right? Wouldn't it be nice if we had the, the inverse of that? We could have, I want, the only people I want to be able to see this is I want it to be th within this hierarchy, so derived from this class, and also within this assembly. Wouldn't that be nice to have? Would you guys like to have that? No? Yes? Really? Seriously? Would you guys like this? Okay. That has been in the um, IL, it's been in .NET since the very first release in 2000. It was in the alpha. Okay. Do you know why you don't have it? Does anybody seriously know why you don't have it? You do. Does anyone else know? The re you, why do we not have it? Because we can't name it. Yeah. You think I'm kidding. No. We ha don't have that feature because we can't name it. So please, if they bring it out and they put it out, it doesn't matter what they name it. It doesn't matter if they name it something as stupid as private protected. Yeah. Next anyway. up on C Sharp, we'll solve cache invalidation. And then we've done everything in computer. We do what? If we do cache invalidation after naming, we're, we're sorted. Yes. OK. So. Uh, I think we're done on question two. I think we've just beat that one totally, and I think we're ready to go on. You were going to go for question three, I think. I was going to question three? I thought you were. Okay. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, question three has to do with a optimization. Do we have it up? Yeah. We yep. have it up. Whose machine? Is that mine or yours? Mm, mine. Yours. All right. Okay. So question three is actually, uh, why does try-catch speed things up? And the short answer is, first of all, if you get something like this and you see it, then test the heck out of it and really try to convince yourself that, you, that you've got it figured out, which is exactly what the poster did here. So if you come down and you read the rest of the post, they actually say, really, dude, really, it's consistently 69 in one case with the try-catch. And without the try-catch, it's not. So first of all, I just got to say, if you've got something as CPU-bound as a Fibonacci, then 30% is, is just not as much as you think it is because, gosh, it goes fast anyway. But um, still, it's, it's, it's quirky, and you go, why on earth? And when, it, when you get down to this, you're going to have to look at some IL and oh, look at the, yeah. get deep into things to find out that implementations can be super funky sometimes. It can be really weird underneath, and you f really have to decide if you care. I didn't believe this question to start with, so I had to and, and prod the questioner to say, look, okay, you say that it does it on your machine. Please give us something that we can run to prove that it works, you know, that it does the same thing on our machine. So I think what we're seeing now is close to, you know, this isn't how you should use stopwatch, um, you know, time the whole thing rather than just one iteration of the loop. Um, but uh, this was after a few attempts to get something reproducible and then find out exactly which configuration they were running on. I think some people on different architectures had problems reproducing it. So there was a fair amount of back and forth. But we got to this stage where, yes, I could reproduce that it really did run 30% faster with try-catch 
and there were no exceptions anywhere. This was just bizarre. I have to just add something really quick. Is my, am I on? Am I no. on? Am I on? Am I yeah. on? If you could scroll down to the question again, really quick. Scroll up. A little bit more down. down to the question. Ooh, I didn't hear you. In case anybody's wondering what I do here, because I'm not saying very much, I have to find these questions, and I just wanted to point out this note. If you go up a little bit more, up a little bit more, or down, I'm sorry, go down, down to the question. Anyway, I put a note in here. I had to note, John's answered this question. Now, you try and find some questions about C-sharp on Stack Overflow that John hasn't answered. Good luck. That's my job. That's what I'm doing here. So I just want to point that out because I want to be relevant. You know what I'm saying? I just want to be relevant. Thank you. That's all. That's all. <laughs> they talked me into this for better or worse. So that's the other thing you did. It's true. Yes. For all better right. or worse. Yeah. Um, how much do you want to do with this right now? Well, so let, let's I mean, just see. I, I guess I want to say things are weird, and things are weird in different w ways. And yeah. I can show you if you divide two by three, and you look at the answer for that. Uh, do it first in X X eighty six. We go, yeah, man, I knew that. You know, floating point numbers are going to give me trouble. I should be using decimals all the time, and prove that to your team. But then don't try it in X sixty in uh, sixty four bit because then it'll be just fine, and you you will think you don't have a problem with floating points, and it will confuse you. And there's these weird little tiny things that mm -hmm. get down to it. And part of it is you got to write your code so it doesn't matter, so that this thirty percent doesn't matter. Now it is curious, is hack. Yes, and, and this is you know if if something. Interests me. It doesn't matter how irrelevant it will end up. This is quite uh, It will drive me mad. There was a another um, really gnarly question that maybe we'll look at another time around dynamic typing and the double ampersand operator, where if you've got uh, two expressions of type dynamic and you do you know d1 double ampersand d2, well we know that the double ampersand operator is only meant to uh, evaluate the right hand side if the left hand side is true. But there are some weird situations where uh, operator overloading can affect operator overloading and conversions can affect what gets used. So in dynamically typed code, you have to evaluate the second operand in order to work out how to evaluate the first operand. And it's, there's really weird stuff. Um, and that kind of thing ended up with Neil and Mads arguing for a little about, a while about whether this was a bug, whether there was any specified behavior for this kind of thing. So yeah, not actually useful, but it will certainly get me straight on the keyboard. How many of you use dynamic? Some Raise your hand really high. Because I actually, I'm always curious about that. Because um, I think one of, uh, there's only a couple of things in C Sharp I really wish, 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 wish had been different. And one of which is the fact that the var keyword works against dynamic. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's really tough to keep c dynamic completely out of your system if, you have, uh, if you're working against something like Excel. Anyway, just curious about that. Cool. Uh, so. Okay. Out of interest, can anyone think of the kind of shape of answer that came out of this and what you would do? So Kathleen said about going to IL, and you look at the IL, and it looks kind of how you'd expect. There are no obviously relevant differences. So what would, what would your next step be? Yeah. Uh, it might be CPU pipeline. That's what I thought. It would be something around that. But how, how would you next find out what's going on? You need the machine code. Yeah. Um, and I don't do this very often, so I had to first look up how do I get the decompile. You know, and if you run it in the debugger, you've removed most of the optimization. So you have to do all kinds of weird stuff to get the definitely JIT compiled in the same way. It will give you the same result assembly. And then you see the difference. Um, and the, the answer is that depending on whether you have try catch or not, Rosin does different things with the variables here. Um, it will use a different number of stack variables, basically. And it allows everything to be kept in registers in one, uh, one version. And another version needs actual stack space. And it keeps referring to the stack, which is sort of main memory. OK, it's a CPU cache, but it's not quite as good as a register. And therefore, weirdness ensues. So yeah, completely irrelevant and arguably a Roslyn bug, and you know, it's good. Uh, Eric Lippert said, yep, I filed a bug with the Roslyn team to try to do the more efficient thing. But it was from the, from the 30,000 feet spot, it looks really, really weird. It is weird. It's very <laughs> weird. Sometimes .NET is weird. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Come tomorrow to my abusing C Sharp talk to see when it's weird. Are you doing abusing C Sharp mm -hmm. at 9 AM? Uh, no, that's uh, 3 o'clock. 
Good. I don't think you should abuse C-sharp at 9 a.m. I think it's too early. It's just way too early. I've got time zones at 9 a.m. <laughs> uh, you should come to my talk. I'll find a machine that works. Believe me. No, I'm just kidding. John's talk, John is the man on time zones, if you don't know that. Uh, if you ever thought about time zones, you should go to that talk. You should clone yourself and be at both of our talks. Mm. So do we want to talk about this more? Do we want to go on? I think we want to go on more. Because okay. uh, we're running out of time really fast, before. man. Yeah. We've only got 10 minutes left. Um, I was actually going to do that. We kind of already did that. I was going to do that with deconstructors, I think. Okay. So let's... You, you want to talk about deep cloning instead? Yeah, let's talk about deep cloning, because that has got so many layers to it. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, do you so want to we do... Well, wait, 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 wait. Do you want to do deep cloning, or do you want to do uh, uh, variables inside or outside a loop? Ah, deep cloning. Deep cloning. Okay. We put it up to a vote. Okay, so okay. The, the two questions this are... this one? Uh, Am I deep cloning, what do I do about deep cloning? Or, this is you, isn't it? Yeah. Um, or something that's sort of now obsolete, but is interesting to consider from an old perspective of uh, how changing whether you declare a variable inside a loop or outside a loop can make it, or used to make a difference uh, for each loop. Deep clone, Deep clone. one. Good. One person. <laughs> See how much difference what you the alone. Decisions are made by those How who much show difference up. you can make in the world. Yeah. You alone. Okay, so uh, so what's deep cloning? So deep cloning is, I mean, we can clone the, the, the value types, the easy stuff on the top of an object, but if it's an object graph and it goes deep, okay, now we run into a couple of super interesting problems. One of which is simply how do we clone deeply? And let's start with a simple graph that every time you clone deeply, you just find objects and um, uh, enumerables that have more objects that also just have primitives. That's all fine. Now let's turn around and look at a situation where some of those guys need to be self-referential within the graph. And that makes it even harder. So, so the, when you sit and think about deep cloning, you can create reflection-based solutions that do the first case. You can just write one. I mean, you could all spend two hours and get it done. But it's, it's, it's you don't like the... F no, it's suddenly my 2017 switch. has died. N oh, my gosh. Okay, this is going to be a long conference for you guys. All the 2017 talks, you should walk in the door and go, do you have a plan for this? <laughs> you know, because uh, that was a, I was on the Internet. And I was fine. I was in, on the Internet. Ten minutes later, I was dead. So um, we're, we have this challenge right now with the versions of 2017. Are you on a private build? Or, I mean, no, are you on nightly build? Or? Yeah. There's I don't nothing know private it about this. But until until just now. I'm on RC. Yeah. I'm yeah. on the same one you'd be on if you were on it. So if you keep your machine live until tomorrow morning, if you have a machine, you keep off the Internet. Come be my friend and be, be my code monkey. <laughs> Otherwise, uh, I will be fine with PowerPoints, if nothing else. You will get the concepts. I will apologize if I can't run code. This one. Okay, so you understand the basic problem? You guys have probably all had this problem in one way or another. This is a really super common problem. Um, so the way that I solve this problem is through, um, through you can name whatever you want to, maybe copy or whatever, and very specific methods so every object knows how to make a copy of itself and call that on its children. And I would have an I copy interface, and then I would expect in a system like that to just everything implemented, I copy, and I could just go through the tree and start getting things copied. Um, it's not a very generalized solution, though. And John's over here typing, I think. I, I'm trying to find my project. I think it's exited Visual Studio without saving the solution I was working in. <laughs> which, is <laughs> which is quite possible because it is a pretty brutal, you don't have a license, we hate you. Um, and we, we should talk to the team because we definitely oh, want to do this. I think Did I you find it? it? Yeah. yeah. All right. It looked like you had some code you wanted to show, so. Uh, I was going to be writing code. You, you keep talking, I will write code of the example that you were saying about, about references not working. I thought it was oh, okay. useful to see what that looks like. Okay, yeah, yeah. So let's just, uh, let's just imagine that you have a, 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 this deep clone that you're trying to make, and in your new set, um, you've got different people, and they're in the same department, and you want that department to keep referencing to the same department instead of going off to other departments. And you keep a simple version of this. It's just something that's up, in the, uh, up higher in the tree. So, for example, if you have a parent that refers to its child, and the child also refers to its parent. Um, and 
One way to handle that is through a series of constructors and just passing in the values. And then if the value can't be um, exist and it comes in, then you use it. If it doesn't, then you just use null. Another thing you can do is have a, have a pattern where you can visit your entire tree looking for something. So let's say we're looking for a particular city and we have a visitor pattern that can go through the tree. In order to do that, you have to be able to find your children and understand how you're actually going to go through the tree. And I'm kind of running out of stuff until we get some code in front of us. Yep. Are you in a position to do that? Uh, yep. Uh, Adam, Adam switch. switch. <laughs> magic. Oh, Adam's magic. Okay, so we have a person and we have a public, his name, person, person, person. Okay, and we want to um, and yes, create I made some this children. Invisible, but okay, we're okay. Good. so uh, if we say john.child equals tom and tom.parent equals john. Okay, so if you take the... Uh, if we have a public person deep clone method and do the naive thing of return a uh, new uh, person. So I'm just going to switch to, these days I get absolutely Yay. frustrated without um, expression of body members. Yes, so, uh, that's a C sharp 6 if you haven't seen it. Name it's just cool. Name, it's and levels. then we've got the null conditional operator, so we can do child equals child question mark dot deep clone. Yay! And parent. It's a shame that this gorgeous code won't work. <laughs> <But> <laughs> so yeah, that, that looks like the simple thing that you do. Unfortunately, that's going to just go bang. Let's, it feels suitable to nearly end this with the exception we'll get. Do you know what? We should really call deep clone from the main method. <laughs> Okay, I missed that one. Uh, so, even if we had, even if we didn't end up with a Stack Overflow exception, <laughs> highly suitable, um, it would have been bad because even if we could come up with two different objects, one for the clone of John and one for the clone of Tom, those two wouldn't have referred to each other. So you would need some kind of object tracking kind of thing. And if you use Java's object output stream. OK, uh, that has this sort of object tracking. It, it remembers, oh, I've seen the first person object. So whenever I see that again and I need to write it out, I'll just write a reference to the previous one. So this kind of thing has been done. Right. So th what's the cheap and dirty answer to this? Some of you have done this. Anybody know what the cheap and dirty answer is? What's the cheap and dirty one? What? Serialize. Yep. Yeah, he said JSON.net. That was a little specific. I was going to. So the cheap and dirty answer is you serialize and you do serialize. And it, it's not a terrible sucky answer in some cases. You don't do this often. Uh, what the heck? You know, maybe you can serialize and do serialize. If everything, if everything is serializable. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So um, does JSON.net support references nicely? I haven't looked at what. I don't know whether there is one well defined, you know, industry standard way of making one bit of a JSON document refer to another bit, because that's what you would need in this case. In this case, you may be correct. This may not serialize worth. Uh, so you, you would need so. some way. Let's just, let's. We only have three minutes, and okay. Rob's over here looking nervous. What? Right. So you I then have, have to have some, some sort of reference tracking. But. Jason.net does that now? So okay. you keep talking. I'll see if I can get it going. That'll be fun. <laughs> so what, what was the conversation you two were having there? Uh, you uh, sorry, the, the conversation yeah. is, can we persuade Jason.net to do something sensible with it, uh, either to give up or ideally to have some way of backtracking within the JSON and say, it's that one over there. So um, in some ways, let's... Uh, okay, let's I'm going to make sure, while, while you're yeah, typing, you let me just make sure the problem's clear right there while we're talking about this backtracking kind of thing. So you come along and you say name and you say then, uh, I, I forgot what it looked like, let's just say it's a parent, and you get out of the JSON what the parent is and now you have that object, you own that object, and now you build the child and you want the child to have a reference back to its parent, but if you simplistically had JSON.net, it might not do that. And the conversation was that, uh, I actually haven't done that with JSON.net, but that it should support it. Um, now you can do this very specifically. Um, so and we, yeah, I don't know what, what the JSON... You? I don't know what a good JSON representation of this would be. We want to say the root of the document. I don't know. You know some, some, uh, I think JSON.net sets an ID when you have to... Oh, right. OK. So uh -huh. ID uh, hash zero, yeah. and then parent is hash zero. Yeah, that would do it. OK. 
All right. Chef for the serialization. For the other, you're going to have to explicitly walk through it. We're, and we're probably going to run out of time. Rob's walking up here like, yeah. like he wants us to be... So we don't get to write <laughs> yeah. our own serialization framework in the last 30 seconds. Oh, oh darn. You could do it. It was on the See, tip of my fingers. fingers. We We've done a DI container before in we have, about yes, five minutes. Yes, that yeah. was not fun. <laughs> that was fun. For you, it was. <laughs> it just made me feel about that big. Speaking of, um, thank you, guys. We did run just right up to it. Um, if you have any questions, I, I think you're going to have to come up. Otherwise, we need to be nice to the next speakers that are coming. And Thank you both. That was really fun. Do thank appreciate you. it. All right. Thanks so much, guys. Yeah.